Hello, and welcome to Humanities Matter, brought to you by Brill. I'm Lee Chung Greco, and this week we'll be looking at key issues in the field of humanities. We're speaking with Dr. Diana Lenga. She's the author of An Atlas of the Himalayas by 19th Century Tibetan Lama and a research associate at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Dr. Lange, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to join you today. So tell us what the WISE collection or WISE album was and why it was so sought after. And how did you discover this collection yourself? Um, Reading through uh, your work, this sounds like it was sort of a um, Sherlock Holmes detective adventure that you had to go through um, to find all this. Yes, it was a real uh, detective story. So the the Wise collection is kept in the British Library. It's a collection of maps and drawings uh, that were made by a Tibetan Lama in mid 19th century, and commissioned by a British official. So. The heart of the collection is um, a panoramic map of Tibet with many sheets joined together with a total length of around 15 meters. And the Tibetan Lama who made it, he, he built up this map from, from the route between Ladakh in, in the Western Himalayas and uh, central Tibet, a route that traders, caravans and pilgrims had used uh, for centuries. And the related drawings, altogether 28, are um, detailed illustrations of selected places, of monastic rituals, of wedding ceremonies, ethnic groups, and other topics. And most of them relate to to places that are shown on the panoramic map. So the maps and drawings are full of numbered annotations and notes in English and and Tibetan. Uh, Altogether, there are more than 900 of such numbered annotations and explanatory notes referring to the numbers were written in English on on separate sheets of paper. Um, Actually, the collection was more or less um, hidden in the India Office Library, where the former British Indian diplomat and and Tibetologist Hugh Richardson noticed them in the late 1960s. Um, At that time, the maps and drawings were bound in three very large leather albums and inscribed with the name Weiss. And this was um, the start of the long search for for Weiss, who was finally identified in the late 1990s, uh, so more than 30 years later, as Thomas Alexander Weiss, a Scottish polymorph uh, from from Dundee. So while the collection was was named after Weiss, he was not the one who who commissioned the maps and drawings. And several scholars who who undertook research on the collection in the past all attempted, but without success, to trace the origin of the collection. And most recently, uh, the historian and Tibetologist Michael Aris dealt with the Weiss collection before his death in 1999, again, without being able to trace uh, the collection's origins. And 10 years later, I, I started um following his giant footsteps when I picked up a research button from among what he called his projects in progress at the time of his death. And this is one of the reasons why the book is also dedicated to him. Um, My research on on the collection actually started with my interest in in water transport in Tibet. So I was introduced to the Weiss collection by my PhD supervisor, Tony Huber, in 2008, um, at which time I I just finished my my PhD on fishing and yakite boats in Tibet. And I was looking for historical illustrations of Tibetan ferries and, and boats for my publication of the PhD thesis. And several Several such illustrations appear in the Wise Collections picture maps of central Tibet. And I remember um, very well seeing uh, digital files um, of some maps on a, on a big computer screen. And I was hooked by them from the very beginning. And um, I first encountered then the, the original maps and drawings um, one year later in the summer of 2009. 
uh, during a visit to the British Library, and I remember that I was so overwhelmed by the by the quality and quantity of the material that I decided on the spot um, to work on this collection. And the map with which everything started for me is showing little boats and, and ferries on the Yolong Tsangpo River in central Tibet, I have finally also chosen as a cover image um, of my book. So tell me about your mission then when you first engaged in this research and how did that change as you further analyzed all these drawings? Uh, so the Weiss collection captured my my attention in two ways so first i was fascinated by by the things i can see so the material the, the colors the content the style and second i was definitely captured by the collection's history so when i started uh, this this research i thought i knew where i was going um, and being trained in Tibetology, I focused in the beginning on, on all the stories in the drawings, hundreds of little details. But the, the longer I studied the material and the deeper I understood the collection as a whole, the more new questions emerged. And I grew increasingly interested in the story of the collection. And I wanted to understand more than, than just the maps. I sought to find out about the milieu and the time in which they were drawn and how and why they came into being. And when I started my research, the name of Mr. X, that's how I called the man who commissioned the maps and drawings, was still a mystery. And in March 2016, after years of research, I finally found him. And it was William Edmund Hay, a former assistant commissioner of Kulu in the Western Himalayas. So around 150 years after the maps were commissioned by Hay and created by, by the Tibetan Lama, I was able to add this fundamental piece of information to what was known about the Weiss collection. And it was a real breakthrough in, in this research. And since I wanted to understand the Weiss collection as a, as a whole, I, I choose a holistic approach to examine the maps and drawings. I, I had to overcome the, the sharp lines between different disciplines, such as area studies, um, art history, history, cartography, and, and religious study. And by doing so, I was able to develop... Um, a broader view of the material. And finally, I, I saw many connections and relations between the specific topics addressed in the maps and drawing. And that was such a great experience and very much influenced my research approach in general. So you mentioned briefly um, what these maps look like, uh, the colors <laughs> of them uh, and the drawings. But you know, since this is a podcast, can you just sort of briefly explain what these maps look like? Because they're not exactly, um, you know, they don't show topography exactly. They're much more artistic. Uh, so I'm wondering, how are these maps used if the subjects are not to scale? You know, if we see uh, a figure of a human and it's the same size as an entire monastery, for example. This is a, a great question I was uh, <laughs> waiting for. <laughs> so the, the, this this collection is is the result of a a collaborative project between two players from different cultural backgrounds. So we have a Buddhist Lama on the one side and a British official on the other side. And traces of this collaboration can be can be found at various points on on the maps. So the the Lama developed his own style of of drawing and created um, maps with a with a unique hybrid character. And he only played a passive role in in their production. So the Lama was the the more active member of the team providing his insider knowledge. Hay's role was, was just to create explanatory notes for the pictorial survey. And every time I look at the Wise collection in the British Library, I'm I'm overwhelmed by the by the beauty and vivid color of the illustrations and by the map maker's attention to details. And every time I have worked with the originals, I have felt very close to the Tibetan Lama and to Hay. 
So having the Hugel collection lying on the tables in the British Library, this considerable examination of the material by Hay is visible, but of course also the Lama's incredible work. So if we take a look at the maps, the, the panoramic maps was made in a in a pictorial style, so showing topographical and infrastructural characteristics as well as information on flora and fauna. Numerous buildings are shown. Um, some of them represented in a very detailed way with specific architectural characteristics. Others are just shown as, as, as stereotypes. And the so-called scale used in the maps is, is not uniform, as you mentioned, nor is their orientation. Some of them are, are oriented to the south, some to the north, and still others to the east. So buildings on the maps usually face the fewer and ignoring the actual geographic location. And instead of showing the whole building, um, only significant architectural characteristics are highlighted. And as a result, many people who look at the maps comment that they are wrong or that they look wrong, especially concerning their geographical and architectural uh, accuracy. But while these maps might not always seem accurate from a Western scientific point of view, they can give much information about their maker. So <clears throat> um, shrunk to the dimensions of the map, and, and ignoring scale and cardinal orientation, one could virtually walk through the landscape along the travel route shown on the maps. And as the most important points of orientation are depicted, these maps would actually, actually pass a practical test. So the map maker, the Lama, he traveled along this route, familiarizing himself with topographical and infrastructural characteristics such as mountains, rivers, lakes, flora, settlements, bridges, and mountain passes. And in, in turn, he depicted um, them on, on the maps. And each detailed illustration contains even more minute details. So for example, monastic buildings are often shown with specific characteristics, such as different kinds of roof constructions, flagpoles, or entrance doors. And in a similar way, illustrations of people very often show not just specific clothes like hats or shoes um, and outer garments, but also ornaments and, and jewelry, uh, turquoise and gold rings and so on. And in some cases, the map maker used symbols to mark specific sites. So for example, he marked government post stations by depicting little flagpoles next to black nomad um, uh, tents and, and every illustration of a, of a garrison or a Chinese residence um, includes a, a little yellow banner and, and places of strategic importance are depicted on the maps in a larger scale than the surrounding areas. So large and important monasteries and fortresses are, are shown in great detail, such as the Tashilimpo Monastery in Shigatsa, the seat of the, the former Panchen Lamas. It is depicted in great detail and even gives information about its its period of origin. So for dating purposes, the number of tombs of the Panchen Lamas that appear in a line of, of four multi-story temples with golden roofs in the drawing is relevant. Um, I, I wonder how William Edmund Hay regarded his his map collection and what is map what it meant to him. So I wonder if he regarded as as curious or as curiosity. And I wonder, did he value the collection um, in in terms of scientific significance? I wonder if he was really aware of the true value of the maps and drawings. So he had no chance to compare these maps with other maps of the area since such maps simply did not exist in the late 1850s. So in general, British surveyors in British India believed that their sketches and descriptions were true and correct representations of the environment and European standards of, of length 
were taken as being perfectly natural and the Indians were criticized for the variable length of their customary units, for instance. But the Tibetan Lama who produced the wise collection maps, he was probably a pilgrim, not a surveyor or explorer. And the atlas he produced reflects his Tibetan conception of space. And I wonder, would he or any other British have been able to read this set of detailed maps showing the route between Lhasa and the Western Himalayas made by a Tibetan insider in mid-19th century. I think the most comprehensive set of knowledge on Tibet of, of this time was obviously completely underestimated in mid-19th century. And I think this is one of the reasons why this collection was forgotten in the India Office Library for so many years. Yeah, you mentioned that there wasn't really any other map like this at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever discovered similar maps in other cultures, especially um, other parts of Asia that were similar in terms of the scale and the artistic value that they had? No, no, never. It's um, These are uh, unique maps. And I think it, they are unique because this Lama really developed his own drawing style. So you also mentioned this code uh, for the maps. How did you go about unlocking that? <laughs> um, so figuring out this, this code of the maps has been the most fascinating and serious challenge of, of my research. So methodologically, I, I examined, I examined the, the Weiss collection by combining two approaches. So first, an analysis of primary and secondary sources, and second, ethnographic research. And trained in the field of, of Tibetan studies and having visited many places in Tibet and the Himalayas, I was familiar with most of the content in the maps and drawings. And some of uh, the many details revealed um, themselves more easily than others. And in some cases, it was relatively easy to, to read the illustrations and to understand what they represented and meant. And the English and Tibetan captions and the English explanatory notes were, of course, a very helpful key in, in this process. Um, nevertheless, full keys existed only for a few maps and for most of, of the accompanying drawings. Those uh, some depictions were, were very difficult or even impossible to, to read. And in drawing the maps that the Lama produced um, a visual account of, of his travel route, which was more than 1,800 kilometers in length. And furthermore, he dressed a range of topics in the accompanying drawings that represent an overwhelming wealth of information on Tibet and the Western Himalayas. And in studying the material, I developed step-by-step step both a feeling for the Lama's drawing style and also an understanding for, for his way of thinking. And um, during my research, I also conducted field work and traveled along many of the routes shown on the maps in Tibet and in the Western Himalayas, especially in Ladakh. And my goal, um, wherever possible, was to compare the illustrations with on-the-ground reality, so to discuss the maps and drawings with local people, uh, to, to compare... For instance, how a monastery is shown on the map and how it looks in reality. And do, doing research on the spot was not only a great experience, but it enabled me also to read and understand some aspects of the maps and drawings that I would never otherwise have un understood or seen. And in many cases, um, historical photographs were a great help to, to read uh, the maps and drawings. In many cases, it was... Um, incredible to see how, how little some things have changed. Uh, some drawings um, functioned as a key for others. Uh, in some cases, it took me really a while to recognize details like, like little circles that turned out to be coins and, and the 
a toilet paper shaped object that turned to be out a sack of rice. Um, that was great fun. And, um, and after I, I had identified William Edmund Hay as the person who commissioned the material, and I realized that the Lama who produced the maps and drawings came from Lhasa in central Tibet and not as I and other scholars like Michael Aris had assumed from the Western Himalayas, I started to study the maps and drawings once again. So I had to read, reread them. And now finally, I, I could answer a full set of questions that I had previously been unable to, to, to answer. Uh, but however, I did not figure out the, the code of the maps and drawings completely. So the key for some of the maps is lost. So I was not able to identify all places and some depictions of the maps. So I'm afraid some mysteries remain and are still to be solved. So it's really fascinating that you were able to glean more information about these maps mm -hmm. by talking with people today, mm -hmm. even though the maps are from the mid 17th to mid 20th century. When, when I was in Ley, I, I organized a little exhibition of, of the maps and I prepared color copies uh, at home and took them to, to Ley. And then um, I, I put them in an exhibition and uh, this exhibition took place in the so-called Lamo building, a building that is shown on the maps that still exists today. So they are not that old-fashioned at all. Really fascinating. Um, Dr. Lenga, thank you so much uh, for talking with us today. It was my pleasure. Dr. Diana Lenga, she is research associate at the Humboldt University in Berlin and author of An Atlas of the Himalayas by 19th Century Tibetan Lama. You are listening to the Humanities Matter podcast. You can find more podcast episodes on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast. 